Welcome to James Madison's Montpelier. I'm Ryan Nobles from NBC 12 in Richmond, and we're continuing our conversation on the Bill of Rights. Joined by Police Chief Tim Longo from Charlottesville, who's also an attorney, Hank Chambers, who's a law professor at the University of Richmond, and Peter Irons, who's a widely published author and the political science professor emeritus at UC San Diego. Let's talk now about the historical background of the, the Sixth Amendment. And uh, in particular, Peter, why was, what was the historical justification for the amendment? Well, the justification really was uh, to avoid the kind of secrecy that had surrounded most trials, uh, particularly in, in England in the colonial period, where uh, people could be brought in, testimony could be given against them by people they didn't even know, uh, their identities, uh, and uh, very often um, counsel was not provided and so these trials were pretty much of a sham. Mm -hmm. uh, and what the framers of the Sixth Amendment really wanted to do, and in fact, you know, four of the amendments, the, the, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the eighth, really deal with the criminal justice system. The, the bulk of the amendments, in fact, deal with that because the experience had been so bad of unfair trials. And so that's what they wanted to prevent. And we've heard these stories in, in past the French Revolution, even in our own shores with the Salem witch trials would be an example of this, right, Hank? Sure. The Salem witch trials are an issue, really Sir Walter Raleigh's problems back in the early 1600s were a big issue in terms of confrontation. The idea that I need to have folks in front of me so that I can cross-examine them and figure out whether their story is true or not. Those are the, the genesis of a number of the trial rights that you find in the Sixth Amendment. The ability to have your own counsel is, is one of those issues. Now that's an evolving, has been an evolving standard, which we may well get to in a little bit, but that's really what the Sixth Amendment is about, fair trial rights for the for defendants. And you're uh, entitled to that counsel, Chief, whether or not you can pay for it or not, right? Absolutely. Hey, let's remember what's at stake here. I mean, at the end of the day, someone's on trial and the outcome could be denying them of their greatest endearments, either their ability to walk out of that courtroom a free man or woman, or, or could cost them their life. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're trying best we can to you know, level the playing field here, give the person the opportunity to have a defense and to be able to cross-examine witnesses and, and so that the government can't you know, charge them with a crime and then plow over them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what this is really about. Mm -hmm. And how has that changed over the years? Is that, has that evolved? And you talked about that a little bit, Hank, this idea of that you have a right to counsel. Yeah, exactly right. It used to be the case a long time ago, it used to be the case that the, the right to counsel simply meant we weren't going to deny you the ability to bring your own counsel into court. It has morphed over time into the notion that everyone has to have counsel. And now, not only does everyone have to have counsel, but that counsel may need to be paid uh, by the government if you can't afford your own. So you, you can see how it's really changed over time. I, of course, think it's a great, a great thing because of course people need lawyers and you, all the time yeah. and it's even to the point now where if you're if your uh, criminal defense attorney doesn't do a good enough job that could be a reason to have a trial thrown out correct peter yeah in fact uh, having served for a while as a uh, as a public defender in the state of massachusetts um, i can attest personally to the fact that a great many defense lawyers were not adequately prepared or trained for their cases particularly when they were uh, being paid uh, very small salaries, had no funds for investigation, hire uh, expert witnesses, for example. Uh, and so, and a huge caseload. Most public defenders have an uh, enormous caseload. Sometimes I would barely meet my client before we went into courtroom. You know, tell me what, what happened, what's your story, what are they going to say about you? And that's, that's not really fair. So as a practical matter, of course it's true that you now have a right to counsel. This goes back to a old case called Gideon versus Wainwright where a man was forced because of, he was not charged with a capital felony in Florida, just stealing money from a Coke machine, really, um, and forced to defend himself at trial because the judge said, no, the Sixth Amendment doesn't apply to the states. And so he was sentenced to five years in prison, wrote out a petition to the Supreme Court, which the court accepted appointed Abe Fortas, who was then a premier private lawyer, to represent him. And the court held that any criminal defendant who faces more than a very modest uh, uh, punishment had a right to counsel. Mm -hmm. 
The question, of course, being what's the competence of right. that counsel. And that, I guess that's a question, Hank. At what level of defense are you afforded? Because there is a perception that if you have enough money, that you're going to get the best possible defense. And not everybody has access to that kind of money. There's no question that the more money you have, presumably the better defense you're, you're going to get. Now, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to get off, but it means it's, it's the better, you're going to get a better defense. And one of the things that we have to remember is that even if you have a defendant who is guilty, counsel is of serious value. For example, there's a difference between the amount of time you may serve for a first-degree murder versus a second-degree murder versus a manslaughter. Now, in all cases, the defendant may very well have killed somebody, but the difference between serving a year or two versus the rest of your life is huge. So in that respect, that's one of the reasons why you need counsel. But you're absolutely right. The more money you have, the better counsel you're going to get. And in some ways, that's how it should be. What's the minimum level of competence? We do, we do need to have a minimal le minimum level of competence for folks, and that's what you're, what you're getting at. Hopefully that minimal level of competence is still pretty good. Gentlemen, thank you.